If you're looking for a place to hang out, figure out where you can take the next step in your dairy farming business, then you're in the right spot. Welcome to the High Performance Herd podcast. Here we will inform you what you can do today to future-proof your business for tomorrow. A big thanks to our sponsors from Terra, IDEX, Kuru Diagnostics, Taz Herd, Tasmanian Dairy Trust, Zoetis, NHIA, Data Mars. I'm your host, Andrew Savage. Enjoy this episode of the High Performance Herd podcast wherever you may be listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode and jump on our Facebook group, The High Performance Herd Project. Today in the High Performance Herd studio, I have Mark Griffin. Mark farms near Elizabethtown here in Tasmania. He runs a herd of 900 three-way cross cows through a 50 bale rotary. This dairy farm has been in the top 100 farms in Australia for six years for somatic cell count. And Mark is going to open his Mary Poppins bag and share what he thinks is the secret to producing low somatic cell count milk. Hey, Mark, welcome to the High Performance Herd podcast and tell us something about yourself most people don't know about you. G'day, Andrew. Thanks very much for having me today on the High Performance Herd Project podcast. So something about me that not everyone would know was as a 20-year-old, I made the decision to travel overseas to East Africa and spend two months in Kenya and Tanzania uh, doing a missionary trip and doing some educating in some third world conditions of people on the margins of society. And for me, that was... um, a crucial part in my development as a person, as a young person in realising just what true true happiness means and uh, focusing on core values and beliefs leading into my future years. Far out. That must have been a real adventure and pretty brave for a young person to be doing something like that. Yes, yeah, I, I suppose it was. It was. It was with a group of 10 or a dozen other young people from Australia, so... It, it was a it was a brave thing to do, and not something that many twenty year olds want, want or choose to do at that stage in their life. But believe it, stood me in really good stead. Yeah, well, it's obviously stuck stuck with you, and it'll probably stay with you forever. Hey, tell us a little bit about your operation there in Tasmania. How long has there been a dairy farm there at Mount Patrick Estate, and and what does your op- operation look like? So my ancestors um, came to Tasmania from Ireland in 1845 and started milking a few cows then and since then, five generations later, here we now milk 900 cows spanning across an 820 hectare property, which is all um, a fully uh, sustained system where we rear all our young stock on farm and and, conserve our own fodder on, on farm and One of our our biggest points of difference within our business is that we strive for excellence in all areas and we've been able to achieve that with our major commodity that we're producing on farm being our milk. Well, there's some history there and I'm sure outside of milk quality, what we're going to talk about today, you've probably got some pretty cool uh, succession um, lessons that you could probably share with us as well which is another challenge. Um, so talking about um, milk quality and somatic cell count is a real passion of yours. Mm-hmm. How did this journey of consistency begin? And, you know, how long have you been at, at, at having this standard of somatic cell count and, and where are you at with it today? I suppose as a farm, right from the um, when Dairy Australia first started their countdown program back in 2002, we, um, we, we've always had... Um, I suppose above average milk quality, and we 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 made the decision sort of in the uh, probably way back 2010, 10, 12 years ago now that it w- was a part of the business. We we wanted to go from above average, but we weren't just happy with being above average in our business. We wanted to try and be the best we could be. So we started putting steps in place around breeding strategies and processes in the dairy, uh, the herd test data, and there's a whole multitude of other things, I suppose. I re- relate to it like a jigsaw puzzle in, um, yeah, striving for that excellence in that area. I think it's, I think in dairy farming, we, we spend most of our time milking cows and, and it's something that's very measurable, milk quality, and you just want to be doing the best job you can and 
you, and um, be at the top of your industry. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. Uh, I think that should be an aim for every person. Yeah, no, that's that's great. You know, and you talked about a jig, jigsaw puzzle, and it sounds like there's maybe a lot of moving parts to say so consistent for so long. Um, I see a huge spread of cell counts out in my daily travels. Um, some farmers struggle season to season consistently with high cell counts and, and struggle to get that under a certain threshold. Um, what mythical secrets are there to keeping your cell count so low for so long, or is it is it really just finding the pieces for the jigsaw puzzle? And can you share a little bit about your dairy and, and dairy maintenance yeah. uh, vacuum, that type of thing? Absolutely. So, yeah, I did a 50 bale rotary dairy that was, it's now 20 eight years old, our dairy, so it's, there's nothing new and flash about it, but it's consistent and delivers us consistent results, and that's reliant on every member in the team understanding how the machine works, understanding uh, the all the different parts of the jigsaw puzzle with cow, cow health, doing the cups on, cups off course, Dairy Australia conduct, and having a really sound base understanding. I, Talk, uh, talk about within our team, there's a philosophy on doing the one percenters really well. So putting all the parts of the jigsaw puzzle together to get the end result and and the strong philosophy we've got within the business as well that across seven full-time staff members in the business that we all need to be have a common goal that we strive for. So for our dairy maintenance, it's an annual, making sure the annual service is conducted each year and making sure that vacuum and, and pulsators are all working to spec. And then with our liner maintenance, making sure they're replaced um, at minimum minimum of twice twice yearly. And and then the 1% is in the dairy. So while this, we do allow for uh, music to be played in the dairy, it's we find a happy medium. So it's not coming at the cost of a split um, pulsator line or a, or a claw tube or a liner being missed, et cetera. So it's just a case of finding that happy balance between elite performance and having fun at the same time. Yeah, that's fantastic. And especially I like that piece around the stereo and, and maybe seeing the bigger picture, you know, obviously sometimes practices or things that are fun or make staff more comfortable potentially have a knock-on effect, and that, that's really highlighted that. Um, and speaking of the milking itself, what, what does that look like if, you know, someone finds a clinical case uh, on the farm? You know, what does that practice look like at that actual milking? So if we get a, we've got a master, inline mastitis detectors on our, um, our on our milk line. So the cups off operator will quite often find that clinical cow throughout milking. If we, and it does happen through through milk, we find that clinical cow. We actually isolate that bale and don't milk through that set of cups for the rest of the milking until the five minute, 90 degree um, uh, wash goes through it and properly sterilizes those cups to try and prevent cross-contamination. We have a traffic light system um, with paint dots on others. They heard if a staff member is suspect on a on a quarter, even if she's not clinical at the time, we put a yellow dot on that quarter or, or on the on the other of that cow. So the next milking, she gets checked. And I suppose we milk, milk all mastitis cows at the end as well at milking. So it's, it's, a, it's the piece on cross-contamination and I say to my staff members now, you treat mastitis like COVID-19. So it, 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 it has um, sort of relevance to them and gets, gets the message across in terms of that piece of how contagious mastitis can be, whether it be mastitis on the platform at the end of milking that gets washed onto a set of cups that at the next milking, six, seven, eight hours later, then gets handled and clean touch. So it's just about understanding how long mastitis can live on surfaces for and the cross-contamination piece as well um, in terms of managing it. And then in terms of culturing mastitis, we do do culture. We send cultures away to, to make sure that we're using the correct product on the correct cows. We're not uh, culturing on farm at this stage yet because we believe that we are getting the results doing what we're doing but at, at the moment and where um, most of our cases at this time of year in the spring are strep uberus cases and they're, they're coming right with the relevant medications. That's great. And you did touch on, just before we talked about the new Corey Diagnostics uh, ELISA test, that is something potentially you you would be open to doing as well? Absolutely. Staff cows have a uh, just a 
very catastrophic effect within dairy herds, large or small. And I think um, it's something every dairy farmer should be looking at, at doing because when you do the, the numbers on what mastitis can cost, it doesn't matter if your cell count sitting at 50,000 or 300,000, um, the cross-contamination of, uh, I suppose, the effects that staph mastitis can have within a herd can be catastrophic and, and um, yeah, very detrimental to people's bottom line and their business. So I think it's something that each dairy farmer should be looking strongly at. That's right. Yeah, and it highlights that, you know, the, the damage that the subclinical uh, cases can do that we don't actually yeah. see. Now, you've talked a lot about your staff and you've talked about going on a mission to Africa and, and coming back. And, and I'd like to know how you take your staff on a mission to have low cell count, because I think that is really key, you know, bringing your staff into that journey with you, getting them on board and engaging them. How, how, what does that look like on your farm? Yeah, just on that engagement piece, I completely agree. I think I think you need to be able to ignite passion. If you can ignite passions in people, that generally drives attitudes, which creates really positive outcomes. And the challenge of that is to be able to ignite that passion across multiple personalities and understanding how each individual personality um, works within your team and, and putting that jigsaw puzzle together with personalities as well, if you like, and understanding what that person needs to be able to drive them to get the best out of themselves. And and like I said before, drive yeah, strive for elite performance, but make sure you there's satisfaction for every staff member and there's fun involved in doing it as well. So there's there's the sustainability piece around it as well. Yeah. That's fantastic. Like it's really it strikes me in a in a core as well. And you know, what spins one person's wheels doesn't necessarily spin the others. So it's like you're saying, it's not a one a one solution fits all solution. How do you actually dig into that piece around, you know, that what drives that person is slightly different to that other one? I think it's a case of spending the time as a manager to get to know every member in your team and understanding what sort of leadership style that you that you get the best uh, yeah, result from, I suppose, and, and you do have to understand, yeah, you just got to get to know people just like you pretty well got to put yourself in in a sort of a sports coach's position and just spend the one-on-one -on -one time with that individual staff member to understand and, and make sure that they have a sound understanding of the, um, the their, their effect, positive or negative, that it may have on the overall team's re result. We could do this in a separate podcast for another day. I'm sure we could go down this rabbit hole all day. Um, and it's just fantastic. There's so much gold in there. Um, so we get, we hit to herd recording. Obviously, herd recording must make up a big element of how you manage to keep control of your cell count. Um, I guess maybe as an answer to this question as well, give an indication of what your current cell count or is tracking at. Um, tell us about your herd recording regime and how you use that information to, to get to where you've got to today? Right, so we herd test once a month. Um, so it's we end up with 10 data points at the end of the lactation of the dairy cow. The theory on that is um, doing it once a month versus once every second month is we end up with data that's double as accurate on the cow's production figures and we get an extra five uh, cell count results from that cow throughout the season. So it gives us a lot better like opportunity and the uh, data image on making those really crucial um, culling decisions on which cow we're going to keep, which one we're going to sell. So in terms of what we're looking for with the somatic cell count, so we don't, um, as a blanket rule, we, we will give a high cell count cow a second chance, So, but they will probably treat um, anything around three to four percent of our cows on a broad spectrum dry cow therapy at the end of lactation if she's had a consistently high cell count and she looks like she could have been subclinically infected throughout the lactation and if she and on the following lactation from that if she doesn't cure from the broad spectrum dry cow therapy she will then be culled and um, yeah exited from the herd because we we have a strong belief that the more subclinical cases you have in the herd, obviously the greater the chance of cross-contamination and cows with subclinical mastitis um, 
will be fighting an infection and won't produce the same amount of milk as a cow with um, non yeah with no mastitis. So that's um, something we look for. That's our process there. We um, we teat seal all our cows and all our um, rising two year old maiden heifers as well. That's been a big change in our system, and we've um, we've reduced our mastitis rate in our two year old heifers from twelve and a half percent at calving to between one and a half to two percent of our two year olds at calving with our two year olds and and uh, and with our cows um, similar similar numbers as well, especially calving in Tasmania in the August month when it can be very wet and you've got your highest milk price month of the year it's very very expensive and it's often quite talk about august in tasmania for most tasmanian dairy farms it's your your labor is is probably worth its greatest in august because you're the most time poor in the year so there's a there's a piece in there as well around i suppose teat sealing and and how it's i suppose helped us manage a cell count that's sub 100,000 through that Carving and highly stressful time of the season. And yeah, with the, with, I'll just tell, I'll just add on with the herd testing as well. So I've, I've touched on the cell count and how we manage how we manage that. And so we actually make sure that our production index on our herd test figures formula production index formula is weighted exactly the way that we get paid by our milk milk factory. I think that's really a really important piece for herd testing, uh, people herd testing to understand that um, when culling on production index, you need to make sure that it's the correct form formula relative to what your milk company's weighted on fat and protein. So that's something that, yeah, certainly on, on our farm where we get our, our milk company values fat the, uh, at the same uh, weighting as protein. So we've changed our production index formula to make sure that um, all cows are on the same level playing field within a crossbred system. That's especially important. Yeah, that is really important. And you, you're right, you have to be comparing apples and apple, apples with apples. And um, I guess touching on that production side of things, you mentioned subclinical mastitis, and you know, it's pretty well known that that has a production depression. And um, Reese from Crew Diagnostics likened it to you know, having the vat tap just a little bit open and there's milk just dribbling out. And, you know, you wouldn't walk past that. And I thought that was a really cool analogy. You, cell count's obviously really important. Uh, one myth I want to bust, I suppose, is a lot of farmers here would get their cell counts, have a look at that, and then the record stays in, in the cupboard and gets quite dusty. There's so much more value in the data than just cell count. Um, I'd like to talk about, you know, the production, the production index and components. And obviously that's a factor also in your culling decisions. Absolutely. So moving forward for our farm, I'd like to get to a ratio of um, kilograms of milk solids produced to live weight ratio. It's not an exact um, site, but it's a, a really close, I suppose, formula for us. We're, we're looking to drive efficiencies within our operation now and have the most efficient cows we can. And that, that's not necessarily the highest litre cows. We're keen to sort of convert that energy um, consumed to kilos of milk um, and be as efficient as we can be um, with that. So certainly with, within our system, even though there's a very lucrative export market for Frisian cattle at the moment, we're, we're striving to aim to get to a 9% combined fat and protein test across the, across the season. And that might be with some New Zealand Frisian cattle, but predominantly our core business is the is for us is is milk so we're we're very keen on keeping that crossbred because we believe the jersey cow can um yeah bump up at those components quite quite easily so while this, the livestock trading and the export market's very lucrative and we can have that as a sideline it's only going to stay as a sideline because our, our bigger picture for the long term is that is that milk and that's our core income primary income of the business and we need to stay focused on that so that's why we do what we do with the, the cross-breeding. No, that makes really se really good sense. Um, and talking about your breeding, I'd love to touch on, on that a bit because it's something else you're quite passionate about and you do trade livestock. Your breeding philosophy and milk quality, you know, how, how does that milk quality goal, I suppose, uh, influence your breeding decisions? Are you, are you selecting certain semen based on cell count? Uh, you know, when selecting cows for breeding, what what type of factors go into that? The milk quality goals definitely, yeah, 
have have an effect on the breeding we use. However, it's not the whole piece of the breeding. The the biggest um, biggest emphasis within our breeding with our bulls is we're looking for bulls with high kilos of fat and protein, but not necessarily high leaders. We're looking for really efficient production of those kilos of fat and protein, so high high components um, cattle, because we realise the amount of energy it requires to to make milk. So we want that really rich, um, yeah, milk being paid uh, the same rate for fat to protein. That's our philosophy there. And we won't use a pool that's um, right, yeah, rated badly for cell count, but it, it's not at the top of our agenda with the bulls we use because we rely heavily on our on-farm management to control the cell count. That makes sense, yeah. So you're fully in control of the environment and um, yeah. you know, leaving the genetic part to one side. You, mm -hmm. um, this hasn't affected you probably for quite a few years, but having a high cell count can be a really stressful time on the dairy farm especially when it can be some days before you get your bulk milk test back and if you had a grade and it takes you know you might have sent three or four silos away before you actually realize you're on top of the problem even though your cell count is very low you probably have a trigger point or mm -hmm. some point where your stress starts to climb and it's probably a lot lower than other people's i've seen farmers get very excited when it comes to receiving a one-off high bulk count they order emergency herd tests they book in cows they try and fix the problem like within 24 hours and they really do get wound up about it what advice would you offer someone who's battling with cell count or perhaps has that spike in their test so the advice i'd have and we we've had spikes as well because at the start of calving for a seasonal herd like us when you've got high stress cows and not a lot of dilution and volume in the vat we're very much just like anyone in the industry it's the same same challenge for us so our process mechanism there will our first step before herd testing would be to strip the herd and make sure the person that is stripping the herd's a high skilled person as well that's a really crucial process. it's one thing to put the process in place it's another thing to be able to have the skill set to uh, recognize and identify and mastitis cows so i think yeah you've got to get yourself or get get a high skilled person into the engine room at, at cups on and and start stripping those cows um, before they get into the vat at that next milking and get that next labor unit and and then following on from that as well from that you should spot the clinical cases at that milking but then following on from that it'd be a spot herd test to then go through your other cows so for us at that time the, our, our, our pinch points, if you like, for our herd is at the start of the season when there's, and it'd be the same for a lot of seasonal herds as well, when there's not a lot of dilution, like I said, and there's a lot of freshly carved stressed cows. Um, and then at the end of the season, when you've got stale cows that are drying off as well, they're both pinch points that for our operation, even being low cell count, then we put a particular focus on, on in the dairy and using herd tests results either at the start of the season to identify those high cell count cows to if even if they're not clinical they can be getting um, going into calf milk that's a tool we use as well to put yeah if, if there might be a subclinical cow that you you're not treating but you know she's eight hundred thousand cell count she goes into the calf milk fat sort of thing so there's little especially when you if you are taking you're not feeding milk powder and you're taking milk out of the vat there's tools you can be using if you you might have 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 or 50 subclinical cows but if you're in that early part of the season i see that as a really easy way to knock 60 or 70 or 80 thousand off your cell count by choosing which milk goes down those calves or it's not just opening the the vat tap and just taking a bulk sample that's a really effective tool i see to be able to um lower um lower the cell count so there a cut there what i do you've just got to um, get aggressive, I suppose, at going to the cold face and finding the problem. You can't just say she'll be right. I'll do it in two days' time. You've because by then you might have infected another ten or twelve cows. So it's a being proactive beats being reactive. And um, yeah, I think that that would be my process around it. Oh, that's great advice. Really sounds like you know measuring, monitoring, having a plan, bringing your staff you know, in, on, into your mission with you, you've, mm -hmm. you've got to really, you know, the jigsaw puzzle was there. It's not actually a very big jigsaw puzzle. There's only kind of five or six pieces, but you get them right and you've got a pretty cool picture of cell count. Um, thank, you've offered us so much value and, and lots to think about, uh, and, you know, as far as cell count and milk quality goes. 
if you think about one key takeaway that someone should take away from this interview, what would your advice be to someone? Uh, my advice would be understand everybody that's milking your cows. There's, it'd be, and whoever's managing those people needs to yeah, have a holistic approach. There's no point um, 80% of the team doing a phenomenal job and then the last 20% not caring and having a careless app because that can be the weak link in the chain. So it's encouraging everybody to get on the bus, have the right people sitting on the right seats in the bus, and you can achieve some pretty special things. And like I, yeah, just reiterating what I said before, ignite the passions within your uh, within your staff mate, staff members or and teammates, and have a real equality piece around um, everyone. Yeah, working as one to achieve something pretty phenomenal together. It's been awesome. Much appreciate you coming in. You've offered us heaps to think about and uh, really, really appreciate you spending some time with us. Thanks very much for having me on the podcast. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the High Performance Herd podcast. Thanks to the sponsors, Fonterra, IDEX, Kuru Diagnostics, Taz Herd, the Tasmanian Dairy Trust, Zoetis, NHIA, Data Mars. Feel free to subscribe and review the podcast. Share it with your friends. The more, the merrier. Jump on Facebook, search the High Performance Herd Project, and you're very welcome to join the High Performance Herd private Facebook group. If you want to see a video of this podcast, jump on YouTube or www.highperformanceherd.com where you'll see a link to these sponsors for more information and more information on the High Performance Herd project which is a real life dairy farm spring block calming right here in Tassie. Thanks very much and we'll see you next week.